Shalom, beautiful friends. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. So excited to launch into this uh, new uh, learning series with all of you. Just remember that if you ever miss uh, if you ever miss one, you can always email our friend Alex, and she can send you the recording um, a few days after, um, and you can always jump right back in. So um, this series um, of the ten greatest Jewish ideas is one that I look forward to hearing your your input on. And that's why more than half of the session is geared towards conversation, conversation together around, around these various topics. So I'll spend about 20 minutes each session, sometimes 18, sometimes 23, uh, to kind of share some ideas. Um, and you can always write in the chat. And then we will invite everyone to weigh in. We hope everyone will consider joining the conversation whether you choose to write or unmute yourselves. I think this is particularly important now because it's very easy with everything going on in the Jewish world to become reactive and primarily and solely geared towards defense and protection mode. And it makes sense because anti-Semitism is on the rise, anti-Israel sentiment is on the rise, and we can come to think that all we should do as Jews is defend ourselves. Um, as opposed to remembering also what we stand for, what we proactively want to put into the world each day, in addition to, um, so, you know, whatever ways we engage in a, sort of a self-defense. And um, I think these ideas, these greatest ideas, are ones that are not only relevant, whether they kind of emerged 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 300 years ago, but still today. There are ideas that historically matter for how Judaism helped to shape the world. And there are ideas that are still at threat today, are still relevant for us to keep alive. Now, to state what ought to be obvious uh, for Jewish learning space, um, but is worth stating anyways, number one, this is a pluralistic space. We don't bring any denominational assumptions to the space. Um, or or political assumptions, religious assumptions. This is a space where we expect different viewpoints and encourage that and um, want to make sure people feel comfortable and no one feels put down expressing different viewpoints. That's the first thing. The second is that although I'm a facilitator of this learning space, I hope that you will push back against me when you disagree with something I share. That ought to be obvious as well. Um, you can reinforce an idea if it speaks to you, and you can challenge an idea if that speaks to you. And so that's my opening. And before we jump into our first topic, our first topic is Everything Matters, which we will unpack together. Um, I'd like to ask you a poll question. So hopefully you all have access. If there's more than one of you in the room, you're going to have to somehow agree, or one of you will have to represent those in the room, <laughs> like our, our dear friends in, uh, in Canton, Ohio. Does everything matter? Option one, not really. There's important things and not important things. Option two, yes, to varying degrees, everything matters. Option three, from a human perspective, only some things matter. But from a divine perspective, it all matters. Now, I never suggest that that the poll options will um, include the full range of viewpoints possible or even fully adequately ex um, reflect your own view. I just invite you in the moment to vote on the option that most resonates for you. And um, it's anonymous, so nobody's going to know. It's not going to be on your tombstone one day, you know. <laughs> 
whatever you put there goes in and out the door. Okay, very interesting. Um, 29% of those present say not really. There's important things and not important things. Very valid viewpoint. 57% say yes to varying degrees, everything matters. And 14% say from a human perspective, only some things matter, but from a divine perspective, everything matters. Okay, of all the great Jewish ideas, the one that I'm starting with in this series is simultaneously the biggest and the smallest. It's the idea that everything matters. Everything, yes, everything matters. This idea is profoundly counterintuitive, especially when the current approach to wellness is to let go of details. There's a self-help book that has remained popular since it was published in the mid-90s. Don't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff. When I was a teenager, we had a copy of this book in my house and I loved it. I thought it was such a cool book that it spoke to me about how to be less anxious. And there's absolutely wisdom to not sweating small stuff, of course. To not get obsessed with things we can't control or lose focus on what really matters to us in life, the really important stuff that matters. However, over time, I've come to learn that Judaism's approach is that we should, in fact, to some degree or another, sweat the small stuff. Not that anxiety is the goal. Anxiety is not the goal, although Jews love anxiety. <laughs> I shared this with some folks two weeks ago, that I have a, a rabbinic colleague in Israel who... Uh, who, who the rabbis didn't want to convert this person uh, because they said they're, that they're, they're going through, so they have some mental, um, they have some mental challenges right now. Um, and the rabbi said, well, what, what are the challenges? And the rabbi said to him, the conversion candidate is struggling with anxiety. <laughs> and the rabbi said, struggling with anxiety? And that's, pre that's preventing them from converting to be Jewish? Like, what Jew doesn't have anxiety? <laughs> Let them in the door. Let them be Jewish, you know? So anxiety is not the goal, although it's part of uh, our modern Jewish culture. We don't want to be anxious about every small detail of our lives, especially those that are out of our control. We have enough in the news to make us nervous. But Judaism teaches us that all things, all aspects of life, are worthy of our attention. Everything matters. In Hilchot Teshuvah, in the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam, Maimonides, teaches us that at all times, we should think of ourselves as a perfectly balanced scale between good and evil. Our very next action will tilt the scale towards the redemption or destruction of the world, not just of our souls, but of the whole world. That's how vitally important, according to Maimonides, each decision we make is. It tilts the scale. This is not a literal idea, but rather a metaphor for our belief in significance, that we truly never know the full impact of our actions in the world. So we must consider each one as of cosmic significance. But how can anything matter if everything matters, you might ask? What I hope we'll find after we spend some time exploring this idea is that what, what seemed either obvious or impossible will in fact reveal itself to be profoundly hopeful, empowering, and even subversive. Because truly, there is something subversive in the principle that everything matters. The most common approach in, to life in Western society is that we should pursue happiness, follow our gut, and be authentic what we feel in the moment. These are the priorities that many people build their lives around. Just be happy, follow your gut, right? Be authentic. But when we say everything matters, what we're actually saying is that's not enough. Individual happiness, individual authenticity is not enough to guide, to guide us towards becoming an intentionally, morally conscious agent. Perhaps we don't want to sweat the small stuff. But in a non-anxious way, we must allow the small stuff to still somehow be important. To explore the idea that everything matters, I'm going to fo focus on five main concerns, although we can name so many others. Food, words, money, time, and property. So in true Yiddish fashion, let's start with food. <laughs> what we eat matters. Jewish culture is food culture. We all know that. 
from the Hamantashin at Purim to Moroccan Mufleta after Pesach, food is central to Jewish life. When we think about the laws of kashrut, for example, or kosher eating, some of us might think about a series of regulations that impede the choices of the observant. However, I'm going to suggest that by allowing food to matter through the lens of kashrut, for example, we see how food connects us to the sacred on a much deeper level. It's true that in terms of traditional kashrut, those of us engaged with that, there's lots of rules. The most famous prohibitions are against pork, shellfish, and the mixing of dairy and meat. However, as anyone who keeps kosher to whatever degree will know, the prohibitions are considerably more granular in their entirety and include long lists of forbidden animals, birds, rodents, insects, in and fish, rules for kosher slaughtering, including which parts of animals may be eaten, complicated regional practices regarding the separation of meat and dairy, special requirements around what products are on wheat products, a whole other uh, set of considerations for great products, never mind when Passover rolls around. Yes, Judy, thank you. A difference between mattering and being important or central to one's attention 24-7. Exactly. Beautiful. Such an emphasis on the specifics of what we might eat seem detail-obsessed to an extent that some might argue we lose sight of the holy, being obsessed with such details. However, I would argue potentially the opposite, that our Jewish food ethics are an invitation to invite the holy in the details, whatever details we embrace. After all, in giving us laws of kosher eating and broader Jewish food ethics, God states, you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. Rabbi Chaim Halevi Donin expounds on this idea in To Be a Jew, writing that kashrut is a call to holiness, elevating the simple act of eating into an encounter with the divine. In the Talmud, our sages compare the tables of our homes to the altar of the Beit HaMikdash, the temple in Jerusalem, that is in Chagiga 27a. <clears throat> This emphasis on the potential of eating to be a sacred experience, one in which our decisions are of cosmic importance, might help us also frame the importance of ethical decisions around all of our food. Most people in broader society tend to eat whatever they want, without a lot of concern for animals or the environment, or maybe even human health. However, when we think about eating as sacred, we might begin to ask important questions. Was our food grown in an environmentally sustainable way? If we choose to eat animals and animal products, are those animals tended to and ultimately slaughtered in a way that protects their welfare and dignity? Or were they raised in factory farm conditions? And what of the farm workers who pick and package the fruits and vegetables we rely on? What sort of wages or breaks are they given? Are we choosing to buy from companies and farms who advocate for the rights of farm workers, especially as these workers are often the most vulnerable among us? So to be clear, I'm not trying to redefine kashrut, but at the heart of kashrut is the idea that eating is a sacred act. We can take the principle of the law, known in, in Hebrew as me'ikar hadin, and extend it to a myriad of other ethical concerns about our food. So friends, that just touches the surface on idea number one, that what we eat matters. To remind us, in fact, the very first uh, ethical decision made in the Torah is the first act of food consumption. Not only that, birth of moral consciousness emerges from the first act of food consumption. What happens in, in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, eat from Eitz Hadat Tov Vera, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That is to say, friends, that humans did not have any moral consciousness until their first act of food consumption. With the first act of eating food, they become moral agents. And that might be true for us as well. Now, we can't do all of it. Most of us can't do all of it. So we might say, huh, what is one moral factor? One, just one. What is one moral factor that influences what food I eat, the food I buy, right? Whether it's environment or workers or health or something uh, related to fair trade or the like, or buying local over, over shipped, 
what are what is what is just one and how do i make that more robust okay friends let's now move to words words feels very easy because we all know how we speak matters Judaism is so clear on the value of shmirat halashon, literally guarding the tongue. This refers to thinking before we speak. <laughs> the, the Psalms tell us in, in Tehillim, guard your tongue from evil, your lips from deceitful speech. Indeed, the Jewish system of belief, speaking holds great power. After all, I mean, we, we just came out of Purim a few days ago. We learned the power of Esther's words to, to truly transform the world. Sadly, the empire of Persia is still a thorn in the side of the Jews today. Uh, that, you know, that's a story about Iran, uh, you know, and how Iran wanted to destroy the Jews. And that's the greatest culprit in terms of uh, threat to the Jews today as well. It's a very relevant story, um, you know, it's over 2,000 years later. After all, the earth was literally spoken into existence by God, it says in Genesis chapter 1, um, verses 3 to 30, you know, 31. In Proverbs, in Sefer Mishle, we learn death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? People um, whose lives literally uh, rely on testimony. The dangers of unguarded speech, the power of harmful words to have real, horrific consequences for people, is acknowledged in our prohibitions against Lashon Hara, very complicated ideas, but literally evil tongue, but more commonly translated as slander or gossip. Think today about the high rates of suicide, not to mention teen suicide, the tragedies of social media. The Rambam defines it as any statement that in spreading would damage a person, their property, frighten or even even annoy them. Words that annoy people um, in ways that might um, uh, set them off. In our day and age, many people downplay the importance of hurtful words. We've all heard, heard that horrible adage about sticks and stones, right? However, in the Jewish perspective, gossip and hurtful words are considered profoundly dangerous. We don't just say, oh, sticks and stones, words don't hurt me, right? Like to tell our kids to be tough, words don't matter, right? Don't let words hurt us. The Talmud likens one who speaks Lashon Hara to one who commits murder or denies the existence of God, right? It says over there in, in the Talmud of Erechin, 15b to 16a. It's akin to murder. The Jewish imperative of Shmirat HaLashon, watching our words, absolutely extends to our online lives. In fact, the Chafetz Chaim, we learn that the, that the prohibition against Lashon Hara is not only limited to speech, but rather applies whether it's actually spoken by mouth or stated in a letter, says, says over there. And this book has been published, uh, this book was published in 1873, when people took a long time to write letters. Consider how much more true this is of our lives on email, Facebook, Slack, WhatsApp, Instagram. Uh, what else do we use these days? Threads, uh, TikTok, um, Twitter or X, right? It goes on and on. Blue Sky, Mastodon, you know, uh, dozens of social media apps. And then the ones that are intended to delete after 30 seconds. Um you know, because we don't want it to lack, you know, last because we know what we're saying is something we don't want to catch up with us. What we say matters and what we type matters. We must not only distance ourselves from falsehood and lying in our online lives, but also think seriously about how what we say will affect the subjects of our remarks. Will it hurt them, their businesses, their feelings? The detrimental psychological effects of being the subject of gossip are self-evident. They have also been empirically proven. When we allow our words to matter, we treat each other with more grace and kindness. Okay, there's so much more to say about words, but we can't only teach our kids, speak truth to power. If the only thing we teach our kids about words is that truth, you know, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words won't hurt you, that actually it doesn't matter so much, we can toughen up, um, and that speak truth to power, go be, go be an activist. But we don't teach them great caution in the words they use. I think we've done a disservice. Thirdly, let's shift to money, right? It's funny, I, I was invited to a, uh, a, a conference, a, a Wexner conference, 
uh, tw almost 20 years ago. And the title of the conference was Jews and Money. Sounds good, right? But then they gave us a binder in the mail and I'm sitting in the airport reading this binder and I'm, then I became aware the back of my binder is called Jews and Money. <laughs> and all over the hotel were signs on the walls, Jews and Money this way, <laughs> right? Because this is, you know, in the top 10 most common anti-Semitic tropes around um, the uh, Jews being cheap, Jews being obsessed with money, Jews being money lenders, even when we were forced to be, um, and Jews being uh, Jews being rich, um, you know, a, a whole bunch of uh, assumptions around how Jews control the world through wealth, sh shifting now to money. What we spend our money on matters. In the Jewish worldview, this is most obviously true in the practices of maser, of tithing, and in tzedakah, charity. Of course, two very different concepts, tzedakah and tithing, tzedakah and maser which are practices that help us invest in the community <clears throat> and protect the needy and support our communal systems. Giving to the vulnerable is a deeply rooted Jewish idea that goes back to the Torah, where in Deuteron Deuteronomy we learn, do not harden your heart and shut your hand against the needy kin, we say over there in 15.7. Again, Maimonides emphasizes that we're obligated to give proportionally to our financial resources. However, how we spend our money matters beyond the realms of charity, because what we spend our money on is a political act. Many people consider their vote in, uh, vote in elections to be their chance to take their stand on what they believe in the world. In fact, I know many people who think of themselves as righteous because they're a Republican, because they're a Democrat. It's the way we vote every two years that makes my moral identity. Right, That one act of voting tells the world who I am. And while it's true, of course, that our participation in the democratic process is a huge part of making our voices heard, it's also true that what we spend our, our money on is the biggest and most consistent testament to what we stand for in the world. For example, many people have recently become aware of the horrendous workshop conditions and environmental toll of so-called fast fashion which refers to cheaply, quickly produced clothing with short-lived garment use. The most commonly cited example is the company Shine, which you haven't, if you haven't heard of, your children or grandchildren probably have heard of. To cut production costs, many fast fashion companies will operate factories in grueling conditions that expose workers to respiratory harm from toxic chemicals and musculoskeletal dam damage from repeated motions all for unlivable wages. As well, the environmental toll of fast fashion is staggering. 92 million tons of waste produced annually. Now, 79 trillion liters of water consumed. When we commit to not buying fast fashion, we are putting pressure on the companies who employ these practices. We're essentially voting with our wallets. On a related issue, one that's close to my heart and that I'm actively involved in, is the forced labor camps in the, um, of the Uyghurs. So much of, of what we buy in America comes from China, and we're unaware that it's coming from Uyghur forced labor in, in, in Western, uh, Western China. And although the House and Senate um, approved a ban, they put into legislation, they passed legislation on a ban of imports from Uyghur forced labor. It was basically ineffective for a bunch of loopholes, about five. But the most obvious one to explain is that they basically export to another country. Um, and then that country relabels it. And then the U.S. can import it from that country. And it being the same product, just relabeled, repurposed, most commonly from Italy. Like Italy buys a bunch of, of toothbrushes from Uyghur forced labor, and then they sell it to America and it, get, it bypasses that whole export, the, the whole import ban. By allowing what we spend our money on to matter, we're given an opportunity to examine our own consumption practices and to try and consume more mindfully and ethically. As a result, we collectively pressure companies to adopt more humane and environmentally friendly approaches to production. So friends, this is another case where this can feel so overwhelming. And I want to remind us, we don't have to do it all. Nobody can do it all. What is one little thing I can do? What is one thing I won't buy, right? Or will think differently about buying because of the ethics involved? I know some people who particularly want to support Israeli wine, right? Um, to support to support Israel, to combat BDS. You know, others might say, I'm not going to buy 
um, you know, things produced in China, unless I know it's not produced from this or that, or I'm going to buy things with um, that say cruelty free on it, um, or buy something with a fair trade label on it. Although these labels are complicated. It's another topic for our conversation soon. Okay, let's move to number four, from spending money to spending time, how we spend our time. Of course, how we spend our time matters, whom we spend that time with, and what we do with that time. Regarding the former Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of Our Ancestors, a book that I love, is unequivocal on the importance of choosing good company. Acquire for yourself a friend, the text says, while also warning, distance yourself from an evil neighbor and do not befriend a wicked one. Some people maintain their old friends simply because that's my good high school friend. That's my college buddy, right? We just hold on to whoever we kind of inherited through friendship, right? Um, but in fact, some of those, sometimes um, we can move on. We can mature from relationships when someone's influence is, is not right um, uh, upon us. The rabbis are teaching here that who we spend our time with matters. We want to be around people who uplift us, who bring out the best in us, who push us to be better versions of ourselves. Furthermore, we want to spend our time meaningfully. Time is precious. It's a commodity, precious as dollars to invest in good acts or, or, uh, or lose on wasteful ones. In the Jewish worldview, time matters because it's sacred. Each week, for example, we sanctify Shabbat, which Rabbi Heschel beautifully called a sanctuary in time. Therefore, the idea of bittelsman, literally canceling time or wasting time, is considered not just a pity, but a squandering of a divine resource. Right? There's many things I learned from being in the black hat yeshivish world. Some things which I decided to get rid of because they didn't they didn't fit my value system. Um, I don't have to name them all, but I think the ultra-Orthodox, you know, perspective on Gentiles um, or on feminism or on um, on uh, secular study um, or the, the uh, my, many other issues, I think, don't jive with my worldview. But I think one of the traits that inspire me most out of the ultra-Orthodox world, although it's also problematic, but but still the, the, the big idea is one that speaks to me, is the notion of Bittelsmann. If you've ever had a friend in the ultra-Orthodox world, they often take very seriously the idea um, that our time matters. Um, and, um, you know, that you're, you're not just going to... Uh, no offense to sports fans. Sports are great. Um, but you're not going to spend... You're, 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 if you're in the yeshivish world, you're not going to spend eight hours every week watching sports, right? Um, again, nothing against sports. But it's just an example that they would say... Right, like that is a little over the top. Um, I'm, I, you know, I need to do, I need to do good deeds. I need to pray. I need to do, spend time with my family. This and that. Um, and so I think that's one of the traits from that world that um, is worth thinking about. Uh, now, to be clear, though, on the other hand, there is a place for leisure in our lives. There, a serious place. We don't have to be an intellectual, hyperproductive, high-achieving mode of all times. We should find time to wind down in various ways. But there should be times in particular when we're reflective on how we're doing that and how often we're doing that. And in this way, the rest of our lives will flow from those commitments as to um, how we allocate our time. Right. One of the things we might do is create a little chart and on one side, write our top 10 life priorities, what matters to us. And on the other side, write how we're spending the hours of our week, right? Like adding up those hours and seeing like, huh, like where, where does my time mostly go? When we adopt the belief that everything matters, how and with whom we spend our time becomes not just a matter of productiveness, but also a matter of spiritual growth and possibility. We are being invited to think more carefully about the larger orientation of the meaning of our lives and aligning our lives minute by minute, choice by choice, with that orientation. The beauty of pluralism is that we decide for ourselves what to orient our lives around, right? There's no one answer. Oh, you should spend a third of your life with your family and a third working and a third of our waking hours in, in good deeds or something like this, right? For some, it might be family. For others, it might be learning. For others, serving the vulnerable, protecting the environment, making art to add beauty to the world. The list goes on and on. 
But it all begins with, with letting how we spend our time matter to us, truly affirming that our lives matter and our time matters. Okay, last on our list today, although we could go um, on so many others. Oops, sorry, I wasn't tending to the chat here. Ah, I see some earlier ones. Oh, good. Yes. Chicken is not meat, Cheryl. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little late on that one. And yes, over here with our friend Janie. All right, let me come back to that one because it's a little longer. I'm going to read that aloud. The last on our list today is property. The property of others should matter to us. This belief is so deeply rooted in Torah. Um, the idea um, that our, our tradition is intensely concerned with restitution for various kinds of damage. So much so that there's an entire order of the Mishnah dedicated to it, Nezikin, damages, which among other topics outlines civil and criminal law. It might seem like something as granular as property law should not matter as much as larger ideals of justice and kindness and charity. However, what we, fi what we find when we look closely at the tort law contained in Nezikin, particularly the tractates of the Talmud of Bava Kama, Bava Metziah, Bava Batra, all concerned with various elements of civil law, is that by focusing on the granular elements of property rights, sales, lending, and liability, the meta actually emerges. Mm -hmm. By treating the property of others with care and respect, we learn to maintain kind, cohesive communities in which accountability and healing are possible. In Pirkei Avot, which, which is also located in the Order of Nezikin, we are told the money of your friend could be as dear to you as your own. In Rabbeinu Bachia's commentary on Leviticus, we learn the central commandment to all of Jewish life and Torah is love your fellow as yourself. V'yahavta l'reyecha pamocha. Right? Which also means, according to him, love what is your fellow's as if it is your own. This doesn't just mean love the person as if they're, they're you or, or matter as much as you. Love their stuff as much as you love your stuff. Right? By learning how to treat and care for each other's property, we learn to treat and care for each other. Once again, everything matters. So friends, what we've seen today in looking at food, words, money, time, and property is that there are, there, um, there are profound spiritual and ethical implications of letting everything matter. But I just want to acknowledge again how intense all of this sounds. It's so intense. We might wonder, geez, if I adopt this thinking, am I going to become super controlling or neurotic? Am I going to become so obsessed with details that I become paralyzed and unable to act at all or live in the real world? Let me say clearly that no, that's not the goal to like to, you know, to move into such a state of, of, of being. The goal is not to become obsessive, but rather to joyfully raise up every detail of the world with more intentionality to a level of holy significance. And in doing so, we can find more joy in life, not more anxiety, in a purpose-driven life around what we're doing. I think the, the bigger anxiety comes from living unintentionally and, and, and suffering through just kind of um, pursuing a happy life that's not purpose-driven. Lurianic Kabbalah, which emerged from 16th century Sfat, offers a moving and complex cosmogony involving divine light trapped in vessels. When we, are to, when we are told the vessels catastrophically shattered, evil entered the world and the divine light scattered in the form of sparks. These divine sparks entered everything in the world, got trapped in the world, not just in people, but in everything. This is the key to redemption. In order to repair both the shattered divine and history itself, we must gather the sparks that have become hidden in everything. This gathering of sparks is what the Kabbalists refer to as tikkun. Tikkun, a word that is probably familiar with the often cited Jewish value of tikkun olam, repairing the world. From the Kabbalistic perspective, repairing the world is about gathering and liberating those sparks, finding the holiness in everything. This is a profound way of thinking about how everything matters. Everything and everyone contains divine light. If you're religious, you might say that everyone is made in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim. And yes, 
Absolutely. But the Lurianic concept of sparks goes even further than everyone matters. Once we embrace that there are divine sparks of light in everything, there's no space that is devoid of God's potential presence, or actual presence for that matter. So friends, to conclude here, in the prophetic book of, of Micah, book of Micah, we are told that God requires of us famously only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. That's a big idea, an important idea, but also a very abstract one. And to walk humbly, to walk humbly, how do we reach such a place of justice, love, and goodness? My argument today is that by focusing on the granular with from our decisions around whether to buy cage-free eggs to the environmental impact of our Hanukkah shopping to the condition that we return our neighbor's lawnmower in after borrowing it, that big ideas will come. The big ideas will come from the granular. By allowing everything to matter, we find the divine, divine spark in all aspects of our lives. Everything matters because everything is sacred or has the potential to be. And from this belief, our most just and loving and good selves will emerge. Okay, friends, my last thought before I open up the conversation, and we can move to gallery mode here so I can see we can see each other, um, is just that I, in, in my judgmental days, I mean, I still I still judge too much, <laughs> but in my judgmental days, uh, I thought Hinduism was like ridiculous. Hinduism, like what are you talking about? You're going to like bow to a rock? You're going to serve a rock? The rock is God? You know, the elephant God, like, what is this, this polytheism? It's like, I thought this was like, uh, so, um, it's like a, such a first grade theology. And, um, and I've come to, I've come to see some uh, beauty. And to be sure, there is a debate around whether Hinduism in its, uh, um, in its, in its academic form, at least, is actually monotheistic rather than polytheistic. If you ask a cab, cab driver, the, the, the cab driver in India who's Hindu um, will say, I believe in multiple gods. But if you ask the Hindu academic, most likely they'd say, no, no, there's a unity to all of the plurality. Um, in any case, the notion that within everything there is sparks of holiness and there's a reverence for everything, I think is something worth considering. All right, friends, I would love to um, um, hear from each of you. Um, and uh, um, if you feel free to unmute yourself to weigh in with a thought or question, agreement or disagreement. Uh, I'll also read some of the things on the chat. Some of these are private to me, I see. Some of them are public. You can raise your hand physically or... Okay, good. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you. Hello. So I have a question for you. I mean, I certainly know about right speech. Mm. And as you were talking... I was thinking, so how does that apply when I am in the process of heat bodhidut? Mm. And the things that, that I'm sharing with the infinite may not necessarily fall into the category of right speech. Um, that was one thing. And the other was just when you started and we're talking about balance, it took me back to a favorite subject of yours as well, Musar, and how everything we do in trying to improve ourselves is about finding balance. So it, it doesn't surprise me that we're looking for some sort of balance in all of these categories. Great. Awesome, Sarah. Thanks so much for weighing in there. Um, so to to uh, to think a little bit about uh, Sarah's uh, great contributions here. Um, first, around heat bodidut. If, if we're not familiar with this term, um, it is uh, a word that, ref that refers to the spiritual practice of isolation, embracing silence and um, removing ourselves from, from speech and, and presence. Uh, Rabbi Nachman wrote a lot about heat bodidut and going out into the forest alone and just being at one with the universe and the like. And, you know, I was, thinking, I was literally thinking about this last night. 
Um, you know, I, I, w one of my many, many bad traits is that I'm not a very good listener. I was the kid in school who the teacher, um, uh, you know, realized uh, was completely lost in my head. <laughs> I was the kid. I was the kid they had to repeat things from. Uh, and um, and I had the bad trait that when a question was asked, I would raise my hand immediately, having no idea it was actually asked. You know? So, um, and one of the reasons, if I was to offer an ex excuse for, for the great sin of not being a great listener, is that I've got a lot of voices in my head. I, I, there's a lot of things going on in there. Philosophers are talking to me. The rabbis are talking to me. I've got all these memories and thoughts and dreams, and I'm kind of like listening to them all all the time. And I was thinking about this last night because we had this beautiful tree in our backyard for 10 years. Um, and we just had to cut it down because of the extreme heat last summer. And it was so sad. It was raining last night. And I was listening to this rain and how this tree would have loved this rain. And I was yearning for this tree to reemerge and appreciate this rain. And then I was thinking about my mother who passed away nine months ago and how my daughter has a school play tomorrow night and how my mother would have loved to be at this play and like and been there dancing in the back even when her bones were full of cancer she was dancing in the back and this tree longing for the rain and my mother from the grave longing to be at this play and and just listening to this rain and how the rain was talking to me about the memories of 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 the past and the longing of the future and just thinking about all these voices and yet also um, how we have to gain some mastery of the voices in our head, the speech in our head as well. What Sarah's talking about in Heat Bodidut, that the thoughts that we express matter, but the words in our own minds matter as well. Because um, thoughts turn to speech and speech turn to action and action turns to routines and returns and routines turn into character. Um, and it goes on and on, um, you know, through that through that cycle. And so thank you for sharing that. And um, and I think that that's one of Freud's great insights is, you know, helping us think about, um, you know, through processes of talk therapy, of actually how our expressions can be healing um, and um, when done in certain spaces, um, but also re revelatory. Okay, now to, to Sarah's great second point around balance, I think this is such an important key that I hope what we're, what we're not expressing here in Everything Matters is expressing something extreme, right? Um, but rather expressing the need to find the right moral balance um, between ex extremes. And I'm so glad you expressed it that way in how we think about our money, because Judaism is not anti-wealth, how we think about speech, because Judaism is not anti-speech, um, you know, even with the dangers of speech and so on, not anti-leisure or anti-fun, um, but there is a balance in all of this. I know people who are extremely ascetic and don't allow themselves to kind of enjoy things. I know people who are incredibly overindulgent um, and every meal needs to be an overly indulgent meal and every night needs to be an amazingly fun activity, whatever the case is. And how do we find the balance in responsibility? And, and so I thank you for that, Sarah. Um, and that the, ba the balance is a key part here. All right. Okay, good. Hi, David over there. David, what city are you in today? Uh, uh, glad to be here. My first time. I'm in Phoenix today. Great. So Awesome. Thank I'm you. I'm a St. Louisan, but I, I, today okay. I'm in Phoenix. Okay, great. So uh, uh, my comment is, uh, sure, that uh, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff is one of my all-time favorite books still um, at the age of 67. Um, but I, I don't see any um, competition in a sense, because I think what that book or that attitude is that don't sweat the small stuff, all the problems, be they small or even bigger, there are, there's such beauty in the world, you know, if we're mindful, if we're trying hard, if we gather our family, gather our uh, soul intent, um, we're not going to be getting lost in the minutia but we're going to be able to be grateful each day and to work hard. Um, so I, 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 I believe that everything matters, but I also believe this idea that um, don't worry, you know, uh, you know, there is a way forward, I guess is what I'm saying. Beautiful. David, thank you for that. And I think that's totally fair and totally right. And I think I was giving an, uh, you know, an, un an, an unfair reputation to the book. Um, and, I, you know, because and mainly because I think I myself, as a teenager was misreading it in that exact regard that I found myself living 
more thoughtlessly because of how I was interpreting this. Don't sweat the stuff small stuff meant for me. Um, that small stuff really doesn't um that it really doesn't matter at all. And um, and I wasn't interpreting that broader message as you were saying. So thank you for that. And I do think that um one of the reasons of our our pandemic of uh, of uh, our epidemic of of worry is precisely because um our inability to zoom out to bigger perspectives. In fact, in the Aleph Bet, um, I've, 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 I've shared this before, but in the Aleph Bet, if you, if you, the word for truth is Aleph, Mem, Taf, Emet. The word for lies is, is Sheker, Shin, Kuf, Resh. If you, if you zoom in too close, you get Sheker, Shin, Kuf, Resh are right next to each other. If you zoom out to the full Aleph Bet, Aleph is in the beginning, Mem in the middle, Taf at the end, you get Emet. So in fact, the lies of the world, the greatest worries of the concern are when we're so, are so fo focused in on the minutia that we lose the big picture. And the word in Hebrew for worry is da'aga, da'aga. And the one le letter that's missing of the first five letters of the Aleph Bet is bet, for bitachon. We worry when we don't have a level of trust, a, a trust in the bigger picture. So thank you, David. Thank you so much. All right, let me read um, what our, our friend uh, Janie has written over here, then whoever wants to unmute themselves next. Uh, Dr. Janie Heydrich wrote, Everything matters when a butterfly dies, as time travel discussions propose. The world is impacted, and on some level, we need to be conscious of that, particularly as we approach our relationship and interaction with the earth and living things. We should care and have our consciousness take that into account with all our thoughts and actions. That acknowledgement of the fact that everything matters should underscore each of our thoughts and actions and commit us to take action wherever and however we can. Thank you, Janie. And I know you do live that and, and inspire me on, on, on and how you do that. And that butterfly effect is so important. That notion, which is related to this idea that everything matters, is that everything is connected. That we live in a deeply interconnected universe of economies. I mean, the economy is obvious, right? If, if the pandemic taught us anything about public health, interconnectivity of the, of, of the world, right? Like never before. But even butterflies. And so, and the environment, obviously, um, and global warming. So, so thank you so much. Oh, hey there, Stan. Looks like you're jumping in. Hey, Stan. Right. Um, you said that there was a divine spark in everything and perhaps in everyone. Uh, sometimes it seems like it's really hard to find that. I'll, I'll give uh, I'll give Putin as an example. If there's a divine spark there, and there's divine things happening, I don't know what they are. How do you respond to that? Okay, I'm so glad you um, you asked that. So um, I would distinguish between um, human rights and social rights. So I think that humans can lose their social rights, right? If you commit murder, you lose your right to mobility in society, right? You should go to prison and you you lose a bunch of your social rights. Um, but you can't lose your fundamental human rights. Uh, everyone still has that image of God in them and fundamental human rights emerge from those. So um, it, I would argue if Putin were to be one day imprisoned for being a war criminal, as he ought to be, that he not be tortured in prison because um being put in prison would not would be a violation would not be a violation of a human right but being tortured would be and um and so um some people the sparks of divinity are so bright and radiant in their face and in their everyday actions they literally turn a spark in them into a bonfire right they are glowing so much remember moshe has to wear a mask Right? Because his face is so radiant with divinity. And we all know people like this. In fact, I know many of them right here, the Hammermans being two of them, um, right? That actually, like, we are so committed each day um, um, to the pursuit of the good that 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 spark becomes so bright. And it, and it, um, ner echad, um, le, le ner mea. Um, um, that essentially one candle lights hundreds of candles around us, that our light starts to spread all over the place. And I know other people, and Putin's a fine example, um, that literally that spark is so hidden and um, and so um, locked away that it's 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 invisible to the human eye. It's invisible to the human eye. And that's why traditional Jewish theology doesn't embrace a, a binary of heaven and hell, but more commonly a notion of purgatory, 
that there's a stage of cleansing, a stage of cleaning off all the dirt off the light, cleaning like uh, moving away all that darkness from the light in order to, to, to bring back that which is hidden. And so... Um, I think that is we're going to talk about this more in one of the one of the 10 sessions around. Uh, well, I'm not even going to get into the. I don't want to spoil it yet, but, uh, but something very related to what we're talking about now around around people being redeemable or not. But anyway, Stan, thank you for sharing that. And um, just to be clear, once again, I don't think that um, the fact that everyone has a divine spark in them does not mean that we stop fighting evil. For example, um, I think that if you're at war against evil, um, you continue to go to war against against that evil, even though there's divine sparks there. That's what makes it so complicated. Many people, as activists, want to do. It says in Psalms, "Sur me rava asetov." Turn from evil and do good. Some people want to just do good. They don't want to fight evil. I know other people that want to fight evil. They're not so interested in doing good. The challenge is to find how to do both. How do we do good acts each day, but also fight against the evil? That's they're, they're, they're two very different complexities. And um, fighting evil becomes all the more complicated once we know there's divine sparks, um, you know, within people. And that's uh, it raises the bar of, uh, of how we have to do it. And part of what that means also in an election year. Some of us may deem certain politicians, I'm not naming anybody, but certain politicians to represent like. Um, the scariest of the scary, the dirtiest of the dirty, like um, and the like. And how do we combat that, but not lower ourselves to that? How do we think about our speech in that process as we combat policies or politicians that we think represent kind of the worst of values if they were to be in leadership? Okay. Hi, Judy. Over to you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I think, well, on your last point, I think that we have to remember, um, as our Christian brothers would say, um, "Hate the sin, love the sinner." Um, we're all we're all subject to redemption. So, um, I think that even though we find many things that Putin does uh, completely unforgivable, and I, I count myself along with Stan on that, there may be things that that person is capable of still doing while they're still alive. So uh, you look at George Wallace, who who uh, was able to come around from being a horrible segregationist. But I, my my point uh, that I wanted to raise initially is that uh, the we can counterbalance the anxiety that a lot of this intensity creates for us as as individuals and and prevent us from becoming crazy with details by structuring our lives in such a way that we make it a little easier. So if you think I, I really need to give tzedakah, but I don't always remember mm -hmm. you say you set up an account to, to give X amount of dollars each month to something you believe in, or you say, well, I, I don't eat meat and that's my principle. And that's as far as I can go. I'm not going to save the, the universe but I'm not eating meat. So however you do it, you can structure your life instead mm -hmm. of saying every single time I have to make a decision and, and you can make yourself crazy. I don't think God wants us to be crazy. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, I think that's so well said, you know, and I've never understood the war against Mother's Day. You know, people say, oh, every day should be Mother's Day. What do you need? One day for your mother? You know, <laughs> you know okay, every day should be Mother's Day. But let's have a day where in case we missed the mark yesterday, we'll make sure to make it better on Mother's Day, you know, or an anniversary. Every day should be an anniversary with a couple. Okay, I, I, I don't know what, you know, what, what that sounds a little uh, naive, <laughs> right? But let's one day, let's have one day where we really cherish that relationship more than other days, right? Um, so, so I love what Judy's sharing here and about how to create structures around value um, to make sure that um, it's not just overwhelming us all the time, but has its own place where we can try to actualize that. I'm glad you brought up George Wallace and 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 his redemption towards the end. Uh, well, redemption is a, a kind of a loaded word, but his transformation. And I was thinking about him last week because I have a, I had a cousin who passed away last week. You may have heard of him, the pianist, uh, 
uh, Giannis, or some people say, pronounce it Giannis, uh, Boris Giannis, uh, the great pianist. Um, and he he once refused to play in Alabama during George Wallace's time um, because of the you know segregation laws and the like. Um, so I was thinking about Wallace this week. But lest we give, um, we should not give the quote, um, hate the hate the, the sin, not the sinner, only over to the Christians, uh, with all of our love and respect for the Christians, right? That Bruria says this before Christianity. Bruria in the Talmud, her, 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 her husband, Rebbe Meir, is praying to God that the evil guys in the neighborhood should be killed. He says, God, kill these guys. These guys are horrible, right? And Bruria says, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? Pray for the sin to end, not... Not the um, not 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 the sinners, and, and literally those words in the Talmud. And Rebbe Meir agrees with her, and she's uh, she's one of the wisest voices in the Talmud. And so, um, with all of our respects to the to the Christians and how they use it as well, we should also own that Bruria was there two thousand years ago teaching the same message. Okay, friends, we might have time for one more one more comment or question here from anybody here. Great, hi Cheryl. Hi, um, you uh, are speaking of Christians. I, I was taken by your, uh, you said about a purpose driven life, and I had to look that up because that's Rick Warren's book. And it just so happens that he talks about the five principles of a purpose driven life. And I was seeing if they were the similar ah. principles to what you were talking about. I think you could mold some of them into fitting into what we just discussed today. But um, I was taken with the fact that the, the coincidence of that particular book, I mean, they're all Christian principles and things like that. But like you just said about um, what Judy was talking about too, that, you know, we may have come first, we may, have, you know, we may have adopted whatever it is, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together. Cheryl, do you, have, do you have still on your screen the five that Rick Warren talks about? Yes. Good. Let's hear it. Um, you were planned for God's pleasure. Huh. You were formed for God's family. You were created to become like Christ. Ooh. You were shaped for serving God, mm -hmm. and you were made for a mission. So, like I said, some of them we can we can change a little. We can adopt. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very interesting. So, no, yeah, you're right. That does sound uh, uh, very Christian. Um, and, I <laughs> and I hope the book has been very helpful to folks. I do remember my mother having that on her bedside at one point in her life and reading that book. Um, but I did not have Rick Warren in mind when I uh, when I used that <laughs> phrase today. But I'm glad you shared that. And um, one fun experiment could be if you want to write down today what your top 10 Jewish um, great ideas would be. It doesn't mean that Jews have a monopoly on them, of course, but what you think they would be, and you'll see if they match up with the 10 that I'm offering um, in this session, you know, in one way or another. Friends, it was great to start this series with you today. Um, everything matters. And most of all, what I know more than anything at this moment is that each of you matter, and you matter to me, and I'm so glad to spend this time with you, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Many blessings for a great day. Thank you so much.